Hey folks, welcome to our second lecture for ML 103. Uh, this is the next in our theoretical section, Neo-Medievalism and Northern Medievalism. So we're looking at a couple of additional concepts here today, both of which are extremely important for what we'd be looking at over the course of the term. Alright, so Neo-Medievalism is a term that is related to medievalism but it's not necessarily the same thing. Um, it is used in many different ways, to be honest. There are scholars who are still debating what does it mean? Should we be using it? If we're using it, what should we be using it for? Uh, I've actually found it very interesting. I was at a conference uh, last October where uh, one particular scholar who actually worked on medievalism and games made an argument that we should stop using neo-medievalism because it was too broad that we needed to start talking about more narrow and specific types of medievalism that we see in certain gaming genres. So in a way we'll be covering that today as well by talking about northern medievalism. Now neo-medievalism to begin with uh, was a term that was come up with by Umberto Eco. Uh, this isn't on the slide, I'm just giving you a little bit of background here. Uh, he used it sort of as a, the other end of the spectrum from responsible philological examination. So over there you had history, and over there you had neo-medieval fantasy. It's obviously a little bit more complex than that. So neo-medievalism, if I had to sum it up, is a way of reimagining the Middle Ages in a way that doesn't necessarily adhere to history. So a neo-medieval game like Skyrim, which is pictured in our image on the front slide here, uh, is a game that feels and looks and even to some degree is medieval, but which is, which is not set in the historical Middle Ages. So a lot of the work that's been done on defining neo-medievalism is very, very theoretical. So we're not going to spend too much time talking about that. If you're interested in that sort of thing, you, you go on and you take ML 200, where we actually do some of that reading in more depth. But I do want to throw a couple of quotes at you to sort of help you approach the concept uh, more effectively. So this is one of my favorite definitions of neo-medievalism. Uh, it's by the scholar Amy Kaufman uh, from one of her um, articles called Medieval Unmoored. And what she says is that neo-medievalism is thus not a dream of the Middle Ages, but a dream of someone else's medievalism. It is medievalism doubled upon itself. So you read that and you think, that's a little vague, it's a little opaque. It sounds like somebody's trying to be fancy with their words. But really, it is covering something very basic. So what Kaufman's saying is that neo-medievalism is not original. And when she says it's not original, that's not an insult that it is a type of medievalism that uses other medievalisms to sort of mediate meaning through it. So neo-medieval texts are often just as heavily influenced by other medievalist and neo-medieval texts as they are by anything from the actual history and culture of the Middle Ages. My favorite example of this, probably a lot of you have seen the Lord of the Rings movies. So there's a big battle in the second one, the Two Towers, the Battle of Helm's Deep. It's very distinctive, visually speaking. So if you're a fan of medieval movies, you know that after Helm's Deep, for quite some time, every big battle in a medieval movie looked a little bit like the Battle of Helm's Deep. So there's a real trend of intertextuality that happens. Now, I'm going to go on and talk to you about a couple more definitions of neo-medievalism, just uh, because they are particularly well-suited to discussing video games, and so they're well-suited for our purposes. Uh, note that, you know, these are just some definitions, however. Again, this is a, a term that gets a lot of debate. Uh, there's even a completely different way to use neo-medievalism, and it's used by political scientists to talk about a, a specific type of poli-sci theory. Uh, some of you who are doing uh, first-year political science or have done first-year political science may actually have come across it. Uh, you will see it in the popular political press where they talk about, oh, you know, this we're, we're sliding into neo-feudalism or whatever. It's garbage, by the way. Um, the, the take on feudalism and 
uh, medieval social structures that you see in this type of thing is is not robust. We'll just put it that way. Uh, but just know that these other uses of the term are out there. So if you happen to cross it in that different context, you don't need to be shocked by it. But back to uh, our actual subject. So for some time, there was an organization uh, that published on uh, not entirely just video games, but that was a, a big topic for them. They're pretty much defunct now. They have all moved on to other things. But it was called the Medieval Electronic Multimedia Organization. Uh, and they define neo-medievalism in a few different ways, but uh, this is how they wrote about it on their website. And I've, I've kind of chopped the quote up here because it's more like a, a whole paragraph. So they say, medieval concepts and values are purposely rewritten as a conscious vision of an alternate universe, a fantasy of the ne medieval that is created with forethought. Neo-medievalism denies history. Neo-medievalist stories are contemporary medieval narratives that purport to merge or even replace reality as much as possible. They are more playful and in greater denial of reality. So this is, in a lot of ways, a very useful definition because it does cover the basics. So the basics of a neo-medieval text, that it takes medieval inspiration, turns it into something else, takes a step off to the left, takes it out of reality, makes something entirely new with it, creates a secondary world. Those of you who've taken English courses will recognize that term. Now, where I actually have to differ with this definition and with other definitions that say the same thing is the idea that it denies history. So a denial of history, to me, suggests a complete separation from history. And something I have discovered in doing my own publishing on medievalism and video games is that even in the most purely neo-medieval video games, you still see immense amounts of medieval history and culture. You know, they're not overt, they are renamed, they are reimagined, they are fragmented into pieces and put together into shapes that don't really have that much connection to reality, but there's meaning in all of those choices, and especially with video games, because think about it, when you add anything to a video game, it costs time, it costs money, it costs processing power. So if you're going to take the time to make your central building look like a Gothic cathedral, you're not just doing that because it's an option. You're doing that because it means something. It means something to you. It means something to your intended audience. And the really fascinating question, of course, is what does it mean? So I don't think neo-medievalism denies history. In fact, I think that uh, in recent years especially, we are moving back towards an affection for history in neo-medievalism. Uh, for, for instance, I've done some work on uh, The Witcher 3, and there's a real medieval society in that game. It's a functioning, fleshed out medieval society. Is it a historical medieval society? Of course not. But it is far more sophisticated, far more nuanced than something like, let me think, Kingdom Come Deliverance, which purports to be accurate, but which is deeply oversimplified. All right, now, now I'm getting off on a rant. I need to dial it back. All right, so we've got another definition for you. I have a little bit too much fun with the theoretical stuff. I'll just say that flat out. You'll get used to it. Okay, so this one I find really interesting. So this is the creation of a really pair, pair of really neat guys. They're twin brothers. They're both game scholars who work on medievalism. I know them both. They're great. And they wrote a really fascinating article about medievalism as simulation, and specifically neo-medievalism as simulation. So this is how they describe this idea. Neo-medieval works, in this sense, do not simply seek to describe, reproduce, or otherwise recover the medieval, but instead employ contemporary techniques and technologies to simulate the medieval. That is, to produce a version of the medieval that is more medieval than the medieval, a version of the medieval that can be seen and touched, bought and sold. So this is especially relevant for games like Assassin's Creed Valhalla where the amount of work Ubisoft puts in 
to reproducing what they see as authentic medieval environments. You know, is just colossal, really. Uh, now, Ubisoft has been very much devoted to that with all kinds of history, but there's a sort of special edge, especially in the context of Valhalla, where there are strong, fantastical elements to the game as well, because it's so much tied into the, the overarching, uh, the Isu world, end of the world storyline of the franchise, much more so. Uh, I would argue than uh, the previous two games, especially more so than uh, Origins. So this is interesting to me, this concept of the simulation. That is very relevant for medieval, neo-medieval texts. Okay, so I could go on about neo-medievalism for a while. I think you probably get the gist of it. It is about um, taking the medieval putting it through a process of reimagining, of revision, and cutting it to pieces, basically, and putting it back together into a new shape. Uh, when I wrote uh, my first article on Dragon Age, for instance, I talked about the concept of the patchwork world, where different historical and cultural references from the Middle Ages were taken and reassembled in a way that you know didn't necessarily respect the original chronological and geographical separations, but which surrounds the player with something medieval wherever they look. All right. Last concept we want to look at today. One which is critical for any consideration of why there are so many Vikings in popular culture is the idea of Northern medievalism. So, Northern medievalism is medievalism or neo-medievalism that's focused on Northern Europe in late antiquity and the early Middle Ages, so the so-called Dark Ages. So not on Rome, not even on the major parts of the former Roman Empire, but they're drawing on the Vikings, they're drawing on the British Isles, they're drawing on the Germanic tribes as inspiration for their medievalist and neo-medieval works. So this is a conscious turn away from chivalric medievalism. You don't see knights in shining armor rescuing damsels in this type of medievalism. The value system is very different. You know, it is darker, it is more grotesque if you think back to our last lecture. Now, in a couple of weeks, you're gonna read a really important short article called Fantasy North uh, by Professor um, E.R. Truitt. So she talks about this concept of Northern medievalism and where it comes from, culturally speaking. Uh, it's probably one of the most important readings you are gonna do. And you're doing it for the Zoom session that week, so make absolutely sure that you do read it. Now, in terms of characteristics of Northern medievalism, they can take on many different shapes, but there are certain things that most examples of Northern medievalism have in common. So first and foremost, they do tend to use the same mythic or folkloric underpinnings. So we have three case study games in this course. Uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, God of War, and Skyrim. And all three of them, in some way, shape, or form, involve Ragnarok. So we're going to take a look at how they use that idea, and of course what that idea actually was to start with. Now, all of these Northern medievalism examples also have a strong focus on warrior culture. And again, it's not knightly culture. It's not the chivalric ideal. Instead, you get something a lot closer to the noble savage. So the primitive warrior, the barbarian, who is still somehow more honorable than the people who come from Southern and civilized cultures. There's, I didn't put this on the slide, but there's usually an edge of geographic determinism here. You know, a harsh land breeds harsh people. And this is an idea that goes all the way back to classical and late classical writings on northern cultures. There's a lot that works into this idealization of the northern peoples. And the Vikings eventually become sort of the main subject of this. Now, certainly some of the Celtic peoples also benefit from this. 
um, the Germanic tribes. When we get into Skyrim, I'll talk about how you know Skyrim is is a Viking game, but it's also a game that draws on late antiquity and some of these uh, relationships between the tribes and the Roman Empire. But uh, the Vikings really are at the center of northern medievalism. So this is why you needed to know that this existed so that you can keep it in mind. And as I said, Truett will give you a really good background as to how these cultural preferences came about. Why do we idolize the Vikings? When did we start looking at them as really cool rather than, ooh, scary barbarian invaders from the north? Uh, hint, it has to do with the Victorians. But there were seeds of it further back than that as well. Okay, so that basically covers our second theory lecture. Yeah, stay tuned for the next for the week, which is on the Vikings history and fantasy. Thanks very much, guys.